do our Wednesday praise and uh, prayer service. And um, tonight is really kind of an important night for you to be here because you're going to find out uh, what the gift of pastoring is about. And it's really important that the church understands what that gift is about. So hopefully we're going to cover a bit of territory on that. But we're going to spend some time on uh, worship. And I'm so thankful again that we have a place we can come and gather and uh, lift our voices to the Lord. Uh, I want you to be praying for Pastor John. He's probably on the road right now to uh, Kansas. And I want you to be praying for our uh, little sister, Christy. She's in Washington, D.C., doing ministry there. And I had a chance to talk to her this morning, and uh, she seems like she's doing so well. But do be praying for her and all the things that God's not only doing in her life right now, but through her life as well. And for Karen as well. I love um, the fact that she's with Karen. Uh, you guys know Karen Lafferty. Most of you know who Karen is. She's just uh, an incredible woman that has blessed so many people around the world. It, uh, you can't believe the number of people she's touched in her life and the things that she's done to bring people into ministry. So uh, be praying for her. And we're going to have Karen come and visit us one of these days. Uh, we want you to hear her story. And uh, it's a great story what God's done in her life. But we want to pray right now and we want to lift our voices to God and ask God just to infiltrate our lives this, this morning, this evening, and to um, change us. We, uh, we come to be transformed. Uh, every time we open the Word of God, there should be a change that happens in our life. Mm -hmm. And so um, pray that God would do that in your life personally. And then pray for the church in general as we gather together as a body of Christ. So Father, we thank fully that again we can lift our voices to you. What a, what a privilege, God, it is just to be in your presence. That you've, God, you've torn that curtain open. That we can come into the very holy of holies and commune with you. Thank you, God, for, again, our Pastor John, God, and Larry, and the incredible gift they are to us. I pray for their safety as they're on the road and their time away. And as John um, spends time with another church delivering a message, God, uh, I pray you would use it to touch the hearts of many. And for our little sister, Christy, God, I pray for her. Thank you, God, for her heart's desire to serve you. And Father, we pray now, Father, as we gather in your presence, do a work in our life, God, this evening. And we offer up, God, now our voices to you, that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together
Father, we thank you for your word, for the truth that it speaks to us, for the ways that it brings us life. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for always meeting us where we are and being willing to show us love and grace. Thank you for being a good father. Thank you for being our king.
That's our prayer tonight. Father, that we, that our praise to you would be a sweet incense before your throne. We have nothing of value to offer you. We have everything that's any good to be thankful for because it comes from you. So what do we do to tell you thank you? We give you thanks. We thank you, we thank you for the good God that you are. We thank you for the great God that you are. We are so limited in our power and our resources and our capabilities, God, but you have infinite power. Yes. You are infinitely capable, God, and you love us completely. We thank you for being a good God. We bring our praises before you because it's the one thing we have to offer you. And so we give it, we give it to you freely. And we ask you to meet us here.
every second of every day is a gift from you.
come to you, Father, with, with grateful hearts and so thankful that, that you love us, Lord God. Father, we let each other down, and, and we, um, we're human, Father. We, we, we try to be more like you each day through your spirit, Lord God, and, and we pray that you would bless that transformation upon us, Lord God. And Father, we know that, um, that we will be let down from time to time, Lord God, but if we seek you, you will never fail us, Lord God. Father, you will provide everything we need, and we just need to trust you. <sighs> Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to, to thank you and just to cry out your holy name, Lord God. And thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name.
I can breathe again. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great time to come and worship God, isn't it? So thankful we can do this. We want to pray tonight and uh, ask God to bless our time as we look into His Word. Um, a lot of you have been with us for the last number of months as we've been going to the gifts of the Spirit. And we're going to be looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, on the fourth foundational gift that God has given us. But let's pray before we get started. Father, I thank you, God. Oh, God, to open our voices and be able to praise you with music and song. What a blessing, God. Thank you, God, that we can gather as a church. Thank you that you speak to us through your word. We're grateful, Father, that you've given us instruction on a personal basis, how to walk before you, how to deal with people in our life. And you give us instruction as a church how to function. And how grateful, Father, you've not left anything unsaid for us. Help us, Father, as we look at your word tonight, that we would be able to grow in it and to become more and more like you, God. That is your purpose, conforming us to the very image of Christ. So thank you, Father, for tonight. We pray now, God, pour your spirit upon this gathering of your saints. In Jesus' name, God, we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the uh, gift of pastor-teacher. I want to uh, share with you an article that was written to a newspaper, and it was entitled, The Perfect Pastor. The Perfect Pastor. And this is what it said. This is the profile they gave of the perfect pastor. He preaches exactly 20 minutes. He condemns sin, but never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. to midnight, also serves in the church as a janitor. He makes $200 a week, and he donates $150 a week to the church. He wears good clothes, but not too stylish. He's 29 years old, has 40 years' experience. <laughs> he makes 15 house calls a day, and he's always in the office. And he goes on to say, if your pastor does not measure up to the, this criteria, send this list to six other churches that are also dissatisfied with their pastor, then bundle up your pastor and send him to the church on the top of the list. In one week, you'll receive 1,643 pastors. Surely one of them will fit your need. <laughs> well, as much as churches might want to have a perfect pastor, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. But what does exist is the gift of pastor-teacher. That does exist. And it's one of the four foundational gifts that we find in Ephesians chapter 4. These are the gifts that the ascended Christ gave to the church. And what are they for? This you've heard so many times, and John almost smiles every time we bring this up, because it's said so often, but it's so important. Here's the reason you come to church. This is the one verse that tells you this is why you come to church. For the perfecting of the saints that God would grow you up and mature you spiritually, right? And then secondly, for the work of the ministry. And then lastly, provide mutual support for the church. That's why you come to church. That's what it's for. And over the last four months, we've kind of examined um, three of those gifts that God gives us in Ephesians chapter 4. And these are the gifts of apostle, prophet, and evangelist. We covered those in the last number of months. And these were spiritual gifts that were really essential for establishing the early church. And these three gifts continue as foundational in the life of the church today. Now, we talked a lot about apostles, and that's really important because there's movements today that believe that they need to bring back the apostles into the church. Please be very careful with that teaching. There were 14 apostles, right? Were there 14? Yes. yes, there were, right? Everybody thinks there's 12? No, there were 14, actually. And um, those don't exist anymore. That's an office that God used a very specific reason. A lot of it was to bring us the doctrine of the church. Much of what we read in the scripture was written by the apostles. The other thing the apostles did that was very significant is they went out and started to establish churches. So how does the gift of apostle fit into the church today? We benefit by the doctrine the apostles have given us, right, through the scriptures. And they give us a model for missions, going out, right? Because that's what the word apostle means, the sent out ones. What about the gift of um, 
prophet. That's also something interesting in the church today because there's a lot of churches who believe there's still new revelation. I happen to believe, and I think Pastor Larry believes, I think Pastor John believes, that the gift that God has given us in the Scripture is complete. All revelation has been given us. Illumination is different. There's two ways that prophecy was given. One was to foretell what was going to happen. One was to foretell, taking the Scripture and illuminating it. Every time Pastor John gets up to teach the Word, Pastor Larry gets up to teach the Word, what we're doing here today is illuminating the Scripture for you in a prophetic way. So God has provided all that we need from Genesis to Revelation as far as what we need to know. There's illumination to that. And every now and then we go, aha. Uh-huh. You guys been in a hub time when you're reading the scripture, you go, man, I never saw that before. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit illuminates his scripture to you and gives you a deeper appreciation of what he's written. Then we looked at the gift of evangelism. By the way, this is one that you're all involved with, correct? Are you all evangelists? You need to be, right? Because you've been called to. It's called the Great Commission. To go out into all the world, right? All of you. That's for all of us. But there are some people who have been gifted with evangelism. And they have this incredible spirit-powered way that they can present the gospel that people just respond. Have you ever been around people like that? I have. It's amazing to see how God uses them. A very special gift that God's given them. But all of us are to be in the business of evangelism, sharing our faith today. Had an opportunity this morning at the gym to do that with somebody. It wasn't a whole lot I had to say, but there was an opening to at least let them know there was eternal life. And I used the, um, the wonderful phrase that Pastor John used. I told him, there's more to life than this life. There's more beyond this. And it got him to start to think a little. He goes, well, yeah, I think that might be right. <laughs> but anyway, we're all called to do that, right? To share our faith. Well, we come to the last in, uh, of the foundational gifts listed in Ephesians chapter 4, 11. Pastor, teacher. Commonly understood as a dual office, uh, shepherding and teaching. So what should we know about the gift of pastor-teacher? How is this role in the church exercised and expressed? I really believe this is a vital, vitally important subject for the congregation. You need to know what pastoring is about and how it fits into your life as well. What are responsibilities the pastor has? What, how do they fulfill that role? How are you receiving what God has given through this gift? What is it and what it is not? Let me start with a really bold quote, a very bold quote. This is what the quote says. The pastor teacher holds the greatest office of human responsibility in all creation. Think about that for a sec. The pastor teacher holds the greatest office of human responsibility in all creation. Do you think that's the way the world would look at that? I don't think so. You know, if you decided to take a survey and you'd ask people to list what they believe to be the most important positions needed in society, what do you think you'd find? What do you think the list would be? Well, you'd probably have um, important governmental officials, right? People to govern things. You might have medical um, research people, you know, working on cancer. That kind of be on one of the top of the lists. Uh, It could be environmental scientists. That's a big one today. Financial experts. Who knows what they'd list, but there'd be a whole lot of things you'd probably see on the list that you'd go, I understand why they say that. Where do you think pastor would be ranked? Probably not even on the list, correct? Probably not even on the list. There's a band by the name of Dr. Lloyd-Jones. Some of you may have heard of him. He had a different perspective on the role of pastor and how critical it was in society. He was a physician, and he is assistant to uh, Lord Horder, who is a physician to the royal family in England. And Dr. Jones uh, left that position to teach a Bible study in a very small, obscure church. And when people found out that he did that, they thought it was absurd and crazy. You've got to understand the position he had. He was up there with the royal family, dealing with the royal family in England. 
And they asked, who would leave such a prestigious position to teach the Bible? And Dr. Jones replied this way. Listen to what he said. I would not descend from being a king to assume the role of the pulpit. I would ascend to the role of the pulpit. You know what he's saying? He says, going, the pulpit ministry is much greater than any royal position he could ever be given. See, the greatest achievement that anyone can claim is to bring someone to the knowledge of God and the plan for their life. That's the greatest achievement you can do. Helping them with both the temporal things in their life as well as the eternal things in their life. And so that being true, the role of pastor teacher should be at the top of the list in the most significant position actually in society. We need to know that this is not a profession. I got to tell you, there's a whole lot of people who go into the ministry to get a job. And way too many do that. Not a calling, but a job. This is not a profession. This is a calling from God. And by the way, the call can be as dramatic as that with the Apostle Paul. Remember him? When God knocked him off his high horse? Remember that? <laughs> that was a pretty dramatic call to the ministry, don't you think? That was huge. Or it could be as subtle and sometimes like that of Timothy, who needed encouragement to use his spiritual gifts. But whatever the calling, it's to be taken, listen, with sobriety and a lot of dedication. In the letters to his students, Charles Spurgeon, I got to, you got to listen to this. This is what Charles Spurgeon said about the pastorate. He said, if you can do anything else, do that before you enter the pastorate. That's how serious he was about bringing students into his fold. He also said this, don't be a minister if you can help it, because if a man can help it, God never called him. But if he cannot help it, he must preach or die. This is the man. I love that. A passion again to do the work of the ministry. Well, to help us kind of get a, an overview of the gift of pastor teacher, um, the study we're going to use from God's Word is going to be divided into just two major sections. First, we're going to look at the position of the pastor, which deals with where did the position come from? That's important to know that, right? Where did it come from? And how does it fit into the body of Christ, into the church itself? And then we're going to be looking at the pastor teacher's priorities. And this is what I want you to zero in on. So let's look at the role of the pastor, first of all, this position. The role of pastor, the gift is teaching. The role is pastoring. And not all teachers are pastors, but all pastors need to be teachers. It's a role that is divinely given. When Paul addresses the elders in Ephesus, he reminds them of their appointment. And this is what he says, which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. It's a gift from God. And the role of pastor teacher is to come from the call of God and the best preparation, where do you think the best preparation for being a pastor comes from? Seminary or cemetery? <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming a cemetery, by the way. You would be surprised at what is happening to seminaries across our country. The theology that's being taught there is horrendous at this point. There's so few seminaries that are true to the Word of God. Can I tell you where the best training is to become a pastor? It's in the home. It's as a husband. A husband pastoring his family, which is the smallest church. This is what the instruction Paul gave to Timothy. Listen to this. He says, if a man know not how to rule his house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Isn't that interesting? So when you look for a pastor, you should look at their family. You should find out how is he, how is he managing his family? What kind of husband is he? It is there where prayer happens, right? Where serving happens. Where teaching happens. And for those who are called to occupy this role of pastor, the Bible's very clear on its character qualities. And this should be really for all of us, but, but Paul directs this to pastors and elders. Listen to what he says about the character qualities. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, 2, and 3, he says, A bishop, another word that they use for leadership in the church, must be, look what it says, blameless. 
not sinless, <laughs> blameless, living a life that people can't point their life and said, look what you're doing. He must be blameless, the husband of one wife. And that, this, whole, this whole thing is a great study because one wife can mean polygamy. It could also be divorce. And that's an interesting topic that needs to be discussed at times. He must be vigilant. He must be sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine. Look at this one. Not a striker. <laughs> he, he doesn't like fighting. <laughs> He's not a fighter. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. And he's not a brawler either. It's interesting. You know why they throw that in? Why do you think they throw that stuff in? Because it was happening. That's why. If it wasn't happening, they wouldn't have to say it. But there were probably some of these guys in leadership that were like this. And he's not covetous. The Apostle Paul uh, presents a, a similar list of these qualities of how to lead a church in, in uh, Titus 1, 5 through 9. But what you want to look at here as you read those passages is you understand what a high calling this is, an incredibly high calling to this office. You've got to know that seminary doesn't make a pastor. What makes a pastor? God's calling and gifting and godly character. That's what makes a pastor. Seminary is a wonderful thing if you go to the right seminary to get trained. But that doesn't make a pastor. And the word pastor, poem, it shows up only one time in the scripture, in, that, in the New Testament. That is Ephesians chapter 4, 11. But there are other words you need to know. One of them we just talked about, bishop. Other words that talk about the same thing. Elder is another one that shows up. Talking about leadership in the church. Overseer is another one that shows up. All of this is speaking about governing the church. The church needs to be governed, right? Just like a house has to be governed. It can't be a free-for-all. There's got to be order in it. And God has set up an order through leadership in the church, specifically through the pastor-teacher. There are various ways that churches are governed. Some of you came from these churches. There's the Episcopal form of church. This church is hierarchically in nature. In other words, the authority flows from the top to the bottom. What churches are these? Catholic church. You have a pope. And when the pope speaks, everybody listens, right? He kind of he governs the whole church, universal church of the Roman Catholic church. It's also seen in the Eastern Orthodox church, the Anglican church. That's one form of government in the church. Some of you may have come from congregational rule churches. Congregational rule churches are what they look at as democratic in other words, the authority flows from the congregation. When things come up, people vote. And they have the yeas and the nays, and the, the yeas, whatever you know, the balance is, that's what they do. That is a little scary, because there's sometimes when people are voting who are not even believers in that church. What kind of churches have this? A lot of times Baptist churches have this. I was at a church years and years and years ago, Berean Baptist Church that existed a long time ago. And that was congregational rule. So when things came up, they had a meeting and people voted. And there are times when fights almost broke out because it was crazy time. Congregational churches, Lutheran churches have this form. Then there's what's called the elder rule church. This form of government governs by plurality, listen carefully, of biblically qualified men who jointly shepherd and oversee the local body of believers. You need to know that is the government of this church. It's a group of men that God has raised up to share the leadership of this church. We do have a lead pastor, our teaching pastor, our main teaching pastor, and he's the one that God uses to give a vision. And what do we do? We're here to support that. We're to encourage that. Do we always agree? Not always. There's discussion on certain things that we have to work through. But one of the things you need to know that is really significant, uh, how things are done here in this church, it's important you know how they, they're done. 
Because people come and go, how, what goes on here? I mean, how do they get things done in this church? Who decides what to do? You know how our decisions are made as the leadership group that meets on Tuesday to pray and to look at what's going on? It has to be unanimous. Why does it have to be unanimous? Because if the Holy Spirit is speaking, he's speaking to all of us. That's why. And if we're not sure, you know what we do? We pray more until God speaks to all of us. So you need to know how your church is governed. It's not one person making all the decisions. It's a group of people meeting together and seeing how God wants to move in this church. So that is uh, the position of the pastor. But look at the priorities. Here's what I want to get to, which is really more significant. I think it's shocking that some people believe that the role of the pastor is only on Sunday morning <laughs> teaching. There's a lot of people who believe that. It's like, what a job. I wish I had that job, just one hour and get paid for the whole week. Oh, boy. And, and a lot of you already know Pastor John and Pastor Larry, how busy they are. I, I probably don't even have to go over this with you. But I do want to go over four biblical pastoral priorities that are really significant. And they should be present and evident in any one pastoring. These are the four that have to be evident. You need to have a praying pastor. That's significant. You need to have a pastor that can preach, that knows the Word of God. You need to have a pastor that protects this church. And you need to have a pastor, listen, that sets the pattern for the church. Those are the four things. Let's look at the praying pastor. I put this at the top of the list, by the way. Not because I'm involved with prayer ministry. <laughs> I think it's most important. A praying pastor. Why, why is it first and foremost important? That's where the role begins, doesn't it? If someone's going into the ministry, they ought to be praying, don't you think? That's where, kind of where the whole thing begins. Where there's a sense that God is calling a person to the role of pastor, it's imperative that prayer should precede all the decisions that they make. And apart from prayer to begin this journey of the gift of pastor, teacher, listen, Acts 6.4 affirms how important it is. This is the story you probably remember in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. There's a situation where there was kind of a little bit of a skirmish. They were feeding the early church. And there was murmuring that arose between the Grecian saints and the Hebrew saints because the widows were being neglected on a daily distribution. The Grecian believers believed that the Hebrew believers were getting fed before the Grecian believers. And so they, there was this murmuring that took place. And so um, the apostles, this is what they said. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Now, when you first read, you think, well, how arrogant are they that they don't want to serve tables? That's not what they're saying. They served in all kinds of ways, and I'm sure they had no problem serving tables. It wasn't arrogance, but what they're saying is the priority God has given us in our role is not to serve tables, but to attend to the Word of God in prayer. They offer that solution, and, and what's wonderful is that they, they say, look, we're going to fix this thing. We're going to appoint seven godly men to serve tables, filled with the Holy Spirit, isn't that interesting? You think, really? These people have to be filled with the Holy Spirit to serve tables? What does that tell you about ministry? All ministry is important to God, right? Every bit of it. Serving tables is important. Why is serving tables important? Why do you think it is? Because it shows humility. It gives you a chance to minister to people while you're serving. There's a whole lot of things that go on when you serve tables, by the way, besides just putting the food on the table. So they instruct the, the church of the role. They say, but we will give ourselves, look what it says, continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And there's two things I want you to see here that stand out in the reply. First of all, the pastor's life is to be immersed in prayer. We'll give ourselves to prayer. So a pastor must be immersed in prayer. And secondly, prayer and preaching are kind of on equal footings. Those two go together. They're not separate. Billy Graham was once... Um, asked, what would you do different in your ministry? You know what his answer was? He says, I'd pray more and preach less. He understood the significance of prayer. 
Not that he wouldn't preach, but he would attend more to prayer to hear more from God so he'd know how to preach better, basically. See, prayer places the pastor in the role of priest who lifts up the people to the presence of God and their needs to the throne, the throne of God. And and Paul wrote this to the believers in Thessalonica. Look what Paul said about prayer. He says, we give thanks to our God always for you, mentioning, making mention to you in our prayers. And to the, the, the church in Rome, Paul wrote this, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And look what he says, without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. In Colossians 1.3, he says, we give thanks to God, our father and our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Notice again that it wasn't only Paul praying. You see the word, the plural word, we. He wasn't the lone ranger, holy man. He brought other people with him to pray, other leaders in the church to pray for the needs of the church. This reminds us again that Paul was not this lone ranger pastor, but he had other spiritual leaders joining him in the needs of the prayer, the prayers of the church. Can I encourage you on Sunday when God moves your heart to write on that prayer card your prayer needs, would you please? We do pray, by the way. We take those cards seriously. Every Tuesday, we take the cards you fill out, and we spend time praying over those cards and the things that are on your hearts. Please continue to fill out those cards. It's essential for the church to have a team of spiritual leaders who are really intimately concerned Uh, about the spiritual well-being of the congregation, and they meet on a regular basis to bear up, again, the needs of the church. And I'm so thankful that this church leadership does that every week you're prayed for. I love the prayers of Paul. I know when we pray, we, we, you know, our, our first thinking, because we're so earthly bound, we have physical needs, right? And a lot of people write in, you know, please pray my aunt's got cancer, whatever it might be, right? I'm going through a hard time financially, whatever it might be. And by the way, those are great prayers. Those are things we need to pray for. Can I share with you how Paul prayed for the church? How significant his prayers were? Paul prayed for spiritual maturity. In Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, this is what he prayed for. He prayed for spiritual wisdom. He prayed for revelation of Jesus. He prayed for the eyes of understanding and enlightenment. He, said, he prayed that they would know the hope of their calling, the riches of the glory of our inheritance, and the Lord's exceeding, exceedingly great power. Those are incredible prayers, right? Those are the things we actually want to pray for you for those things as well. We have the things that are very physical in your needs, in your life that we need to pray for, but there's those incredible deeper things, those needs that are spiritual. And those are the things that, again, that will sustain your life, the spiritual things that will change you, that you can continue walking in power. So let's look at the proclaiming pastor. That's the praying pastor. Pastor has to pray. There's no question about that. A pastor is dedicated to prayer, but he's also a proclaimer of the word. So this word, pastor, again, poem, means shepherd. One of the main responsibilities of a shepherd is to make sure the sheep are well fed, well fed. You remember the story of Peter. You remember he kind of blew it with Jesus and denied him. Jesus goes to the cross. Peter's just bummed out, decides he wants to go fishing, Eventually, Jesus catches up with him, and he has this incredible encounter of restoration. You remember that? Wonderful story. And what Jesus does, he asks him three times, do you love me? And then his answer was, feed my sheep. Do you like, feed my sheep? Three times he says, feed my sheep. What do you think Jesus wants Peter to do? (laughs) Feed the sheep, right? That was the directive for Peter. Listen to um, what Peter writes. He learned. 
First Peter 5, 2, he says, feed the flock, which is among you, as he is ministering to other people. Paul tells the elders in Acts 20, 28, feed the sheep of God. See, the issue is not in the feeding. It's in the food, right? It's not in the feeding. It's in the food. See, the directive of what pastors are to feed the flock is pretty clear. Jeremiah 3.15 says this, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Matthew 4.4, great passage. It is written, you know this one, Man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but every word comes from God. 2 Peter 4.2 Paul was very direct with Timothy. He just says, preach the word, right? So we know what pastors are supposed to do. They're supposed to preach the word. But there's a whole lot of variety of spiritual food out there today. So there's the artificial word that's out there. Anything but the word, right? They mask it. There's uh, the light word, like Bud Light, kind of. <laughs> Low spiritual calorie, a lot of fluff. There's junk food word. That's called feel-good theology. And oh boy, is that rampant today. Tell me what I want to hear. Make me feel good about myself. Tell me how good I am. There's a fleshly word. It accommodates the world. My boy, is that rampant today in the churches. And then there's the good old prosperity word. Health and wealth, right? All that is out there. Every bit of it is out there in churches today. I think we all recognize that we're living in the times of Hosea. This is what it says in Hosea. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. See, biblical illiteracy is running rampant through churches today. And even those claiming to be evangelicals have forfeited the very basic tenets of doctrine found in the Scripture. Why don't you listen to this? Lifeway Ministries, some of you are probably familiar with Lifeway Ministries. They did a survey, and listen to what they found in the survey. They said 50% of born-again evangelicals do not believe in the core doctrines of Christianity. 50% of the core Tenants of Scripture are not believed by evangelicals. They include Jesus, the only Savior. That's a big one, don't you think? They don't believe that the Word of God is authoritative. They don't believe that one must come to Christ to be saved. They don't believe that it's our responsibility to go out into the world and share the gospel. 50% of evangelicals today are in that camp. What has happened? See, the pastor teaches to proclaim the pure, unadulterated Word of God. The pastors today are really faced with this relentless pressure to do everything but preach the Word of God. They're encouraged to be storytellers, comedians, psychologists, psychiatrists, motivational speakers, They're warned to steer clear of these um, topics that are unpleasant. They're encouraged to preach messages that meet the cultural norms. But listen, uh, the pastor whose passion biblically has only one option, preach the word, be ready in season, and be ready out of season. See, um, pastors are called to feed the sheep, not to entertain the goats. And they do this by proclaiming, listen, the full counsel of God. From Genesis to Revelation. Teaching everything that God has revealed. Taught in a literal interpretation to bring understanding to the text to produce spiritual maturity. Paul warned this in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. He said this, for the time has come, and the time has come, by the way, when they will not endure sound doctrine 
But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall turn, be turned to fables. Time is here, man. It's exactly what's going on in churches. There is no room for a pastor to give people what they want to hear. You don't do it. I hope you don't do it at home with your kids to just tell them what they want to hear. <laughs> you, don't need, you got to tell them what they need to know, Right? Pastors are never to please people, preach to please, to please people. Galatians 1 says, Paul said this, for, I, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For I pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. See, the tasks are pretty rigorous to be a pastor. They're definitely not for the weak. Someone described the pastor's qualifications this way. He must have the mind of a scholar, the heart of a child, the height of a rhinoceros, because he needs to preach the word, and sometimes he needs to reprove and rebuke. And that's not easy to do that. Paul's exhortation to Titus is this, speak Thou the things which have become sound doctrine. Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast to the form of sound words, which thou hast heard me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. How does that come about? Here's how it comes about. Study the show thyself approved. That's how it comes about. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what the word of truth. And it speaks of dedication and accountability to preaching the word of God. Great quote I found here by John Knox. He said this, I have never once feared the devil, but I tremble every time I enter the pulpit. And any pastor that is at all in line with God in any way will tell you the same thing, that every time we come up here to present to God, we do it with trembling because we realize the accountability we have before God. So what else does a pastor do? He's got to be a praying pastor. For sure. He's got to be a preaching pastor. He's got to be a protecting pastor. The longer you walk with the Lord, the more you realize the world is not a playground. It's a battlefield, right? Yeah. And with the imminent return of Christ, the battles are really escalating. The greatest danger to the church comes in the form of false doctrine. And Jesus described the events that would be Evident prior to his return, he says, take heed that no man, what? Deceive you, right? Deceive you. And the word deceive means to cause to wander off the path. I was reading some stuff about sheep. And they said the biggest problem managing sheep is they come off the path. <laughs> What's the safest place for a sheep to be? Close to the shepherd, right? The closer that sheep is to the shepherd, the safer they are. That should tell us something about our own walk with Christ, don't you think? See, the concern of believers wandering off the path of God's word because of the infiltration of false doctrine was really at the heart of the New Testament writers because they knew the devastation that would result if pastors were unengaged in protecting the flock. The last time that Paul meets with the elders in Ephesus, this is what he warns them. He says this, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous Wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says, you're going to be attacked from the outside and you're going to be attacked from the inside. Peter warns in 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Peter 2.1, he says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets teachers among you, who privy shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that has brought them, and upon themselves swift destruction. Jude 4 says this, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They crept into the church. You know why? Because they were creeps. That's why they crept in. And they're always creeps. 
Listen, false doctrine goes way back, doesn't it? Where to how far back does it go? To chapter 3 of Genesis, right? False doctrine. It's the way it began. With a simple question. Just a question. Did God really say? That's where it started. Once you start to question the word of God, oh boy, are you on a path to destruction. Why is it so destructive? Why is false doctrine? Listen, it's deceptive, first of all. It's a lie that appears to be true. That's why. If you don't know the truth, you're going to be easily deceived. There's some slick people out there, believe me. And you're dealing with satanic stuff. Satan's been around for a long time. He knows every trick in the book. It's destructive because it's divisive. It always separates. False doctrine will always separate. It'll never unite. And it's incredibly destructive because it comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Because under the veneer of spirituality, these false teachers coat their message with lies, and they know how to cater to its ears. You know, the really sad part about all of this is that they also fool desperate, hurting people who are passionate for God who are ignorant of the word of God. They, they want to know who God is, but they're swept away. Do you know who occupies most of the seats in cults? It's people who used to go to church, in a real church, Bible church. They were ignorant of the word. See, false doctrine manifests itself in several ways. It's going to be opposing biblical inerrancy. Once you start to question that it's not God's word, you're on a bad path. Cultural dictates of interpretation. Boy, is that being prominent today, isn't it? Change the word of God so you can accommodate the culture. Really? We've never been told to do that. We're to be declaring the words so the culture will get right with God. Biblical illiteracy. Emotion declaring the truth, dictating the truth. It's the way I feel. I feel this way, so it must be true. Really? I hear from the Word of God that the heart is what? Deceitful amongst what? Everything else. And then wins the doctrine to blow through the church. Oh, boy. Most of you have been around long enough to know what I'm talking about. You guys remember uh, a while back, a while back, laughing in the spirit? Remember that movement? It started to sweep across the churches, and they'd have a service, and somebody started laughing, and everybody started laughing, and said, the Holy Spirit, laughter. And they were rolling on the ground, and that wasn't quite good enough. So they started barking in the spirit. They moved from laughing in the spirit to barking in the spirit craziness. I mean, if you ever watch this on video, it'll shock you, man. That wasn't good enough. The next thing was vomiting in the spirit. And that moved through the church as well. Winds of doctrine moving through, and everybody thought, this is it. The Holy Spirit is, man, this is it. You need to be careful. Here's the latest one. You got to be really careful. It's a deliverance movement. It's the idea that everything that happens to you, everything that happens to you is the devil. The devil is not your biggest enemy. I know sometimes we think he's not your biggest enemy. He's your enemy. And God tells us how to deal with our enemy. It's very clear how we deal with him. Your biggest enemy is you. It's your flesh. It's not the world. Don't blame the world. Well, you don't understand. I'm so infiltrated with the world. It's just all the things I'm hearing and blah, blah, blah. And it's the government. And... No. It's your flesh. Now, Satan will use your flesh and stimulate your flesh to do all kinds of weird things. Absolutely. Be so careful. I think of Ashbury. Remember Ashbury? The movement? Do you guys Remember? That was huge. It was on national news. It was like everywhere. I'm going, well, what happened to Ashbury? Where's the rest of the movement? <laughs> what happened? What's going on with Ashbury? 
Is, I, I'd like to know where are those believers are. They are they growing? Are they are they what are they are they in ministry? Or was it this thing that just blew through that school or schools and they made national news and now they're gone? I just tell you, be careful with movements in the church. Be careful with that. Look at Scripture. Line it up with Scripture. And if you're not sure, come and talk to your leadership. So how does leadership protect believers from Saul's doctrine? Apply, this is how we do it. We apply first. Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. We use the word of God as our plumb line. For some of you who are familiar with construction, plumb lines are invaluable, right? Why so? It tells you what's straight, right? It's not like where I grew up in Pecos where the houses are like this. <laughs> the walls are like this. They said, yeah, it looks pretty straight to me. Um, First John 4, 1 John 4.1 says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are from God, because many false prophets are gone out of the world. You know what else you need to do? What a church needs to do when it gets significant enough? You need to call them out by name. I have no problem calling people out. But here's, a, here's a group of people. Those are really familiar faces to a lot of you. Some of you have probably watched them. Maybe some of you listen to him. And um, man, it's an incredible uh, array of false doctrine. Huge false doctrine. Oh man, one of my favorites was Benny Hinn. Remember Benny Hinn? Yeah. He's the guy that said that uh, there was not a trinity, there was actually nine Godhead, people in the Godhead. Not three, nine. And people believed him. Um, I can tell you to be careful. There is um, names that you need to stay away from. Joel Olstein. A lot of people go, yo, but I listen to him. He makes me feel good because he has such wonderful words. He just makes me feel good. Jesse Duplantis. Oh, my goodness. Joyce Myers. Kenneth Hagen. Creflo Dollar. John Hagee. You know what they have all in common? You know what all these people have in common? There's one thing they have in common besides false doctrine. They're rich. They are multi-millionaires. Follow the money. Every one of them. And they're the ones to tell you, send me the money, and I'll pray over <laughs> your seed offering that God will just multiply your... Oh, God. You know, there's a special place that God has for them one day. I'm serious. What they're doing is just... You know, and I hear people say this. Well, not everything is bad. You tell me, how much arsenic does it take to kill you? Do you anybody know? Anybody know? 100 milligrams. You know how much 100 milligrams is? not a pound. <laughs> it's just a little bit. How much false doctrine will destroy you? Just a little bit, not much. Ephesians 4.14 says, And he gave some as pastor teachers that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried out, that's what it says, by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Well, here's one last thing, and we'll finish with this. A pastor has to be a patterning, pa a patterning pastor. Patterning pastor. A patterning pastor. He needs to be an example to the flock. He needs to show the example what it means to be a follower of Christ. Here's what Paul said. Be ye followers of me as I am also who? Christ. The pastor's Preaching should be reflected in his day-to-day -day living. It's not enough to come and give a good sermon. One of the things that we emphasize to our worship team up here, there's two 
visible, very visible ministries in this church, very visible. One is preaching, because John is up there all by himself. <laughs> you know what the other one is? The worship team. And we pray, God help us to live a godly life, that when we go out from this church, we'll reflect what it means to be a follower of Christ. Because people are looking at our lives here. They, they see us here. See, this was Paul's message in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. He said, For our gospel came to you not only in word only, but also in power in the Holy Ghost. And look what he says, And in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among for your sake. He said, You saw our life. You know how it reflected the word of God in our life. So what was the result? In verse 6 and 7, it says, You also became imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with joy in the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all believers in Macedonia and all of Archaea. What an incredible thing. Because of their lives, because they expressed the way, what it means to live as a Christian, they were an example to others, and others then followed that. It's like the old game... Simon Says. Do you guys ever play Simon Says when you're young? Well, this one is Jesus Says. <laughs> the role of the pastor is to be a praying pastor, a preaching pastor, a protecting pastor, a pattern-setting pastor. And listen, let me tell you one more thing. Because of this incredibly high calling, you need to be praying for your pastors. Please be praying for us. Hebrews 13, 17, and 18 speaks about how you can support your pastor. It's very direct. It's a very interesting passage. It's what it says. Obey your leaders and submit to them. That is, it. make sure that they're speaking the word of God. <laughs> That's important, right? For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And then he says, pray for us. For we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably, honorably in all things. I guess if I could summarize um, one verse of the heart of a pastor, I think it would be in Galatians 4.19. This is what it says. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ is formed in you. He says, I'm going to work and work and work and work until Christ is formed in you. That's the heart of a pastor. Important you know what pastoring is about. It's an important gift that God has given the church. It's not the only gift, but it's a gift God has given the church. You need to know how the church is governed. That's really important that you know how do things work in this church. And if you ever have questions, please talk to Larry. Talk to John. We'll be happy to sit down and talk to you. We, this church, the leadership is transparent, believe me. They will be happy to tell you whatever you want to know what goes on. Anyway, we're going to continue. Now we move away from the foundational gifts. We're going to move into the gifts given to the whole church. And we're probably going to be looking at the gift of mercy next time we meet. These are the ones, again, and our goal in all of what we're doing in this study, for you to identify your gift, the main gift that God has given you, and then to use it to God's glory, okay? So what we want to do is we want to gather together and pray. So we're going to get together in groups of maybe six or eight. And... Um, I want you to be praying for Pastor John as he's away, for Christy. I want you to be praying for the leadership. Now you know what to pray for. That's important. Okay, so let's spend some time in prayer. Dad, yes, ma'am. We have a very special night. Um, we're going to go see one of her staff recovery under the treatment. Joe? Joel Quintana. Yes. Well, let's pray right now for Joel. Father, we're thankful that we can lift up our brethren our bodies got break, they wear out, and Father, we hurt, and Father, 
We're praying now for Joel that in the midst of this recovery for knee surgery, we pray, Father, that you would strengthen him through it all. In the midst of it all, God, even to give thanks. God, we're encouraged. We're taught in the word of God that in giving thanks in all things. We're grateful, Father, again, that you are the great healer. And we, Father, we thank you that in the midst of the pain, it reminds us that one day there will be no more pain. We look forward to that day. So God, comfort Joel right now and bless his life as he continues to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's go ahead and um, get together and maybe six or eight people.